Welcome to uh, the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. In the next couple of hours, we're going to be talking about liberty issues. And we're keeping in mind that uh, we are not asking for the government to give us liberty. We are asking you as an individual to think about whether or not you act, what liberty means and whether or not you actually have it and what you are willing to do to preserve it or to get it back if you believe it's lost. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine, and uh, my home point in being here this morning is to ensure that the message gets out, to give you an opportunity to call in and participate in the show either through the old-fashioned analog lines. That's right, you call 458-TALK if you're out of the area code, whether you're down in Anchorage or Juneau or in points further south at a 907 first, 907-458-TALK. Or you can join us in the chat room. I am currently there awaiting your comments at KFAR660.com. Welcome to the show. Sitting across from me, one of the sponsors is Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises. When performance matters, call Bighorn. Yeah. How are you doing today? You know what? It's Saturday morning. I'm a little sore because I did about eight miles yesterday. Four, uh, three and a half running, another half mile walking, and then I did uh, four miles on the treadmill. So, yeah, I'm a little... <laughs> Oh, sore this morning. Thanks for asking. How about you? How are you doing this morning? I woke up and walked to the car. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good about it. Well, Aaron and David aren't here. I guess since I wasn't here last week, they figured they got the week off. I don't know what the Just heck. Trade out a little bit there. They're on their way in, though. Or Aaron is. I think Dave will be here in hour two, which we'll also have... Uh, Russ Millette. Russ Millette. Newly elect... Well, chairman elect of the Alaskan Republican Party. Which he doesn't actually take power until next February, I believe, mm-hmm. unless there's a rule change or something along those lines. Kind of, kind of interesting. I don't really know the guy. I met him. Well, didn't even actually meet per se, as in shaking his hand and sitting down, having a conversation with him. I heard him talk a few times, and that uh, when they were having the vote for the chairman, mm-hmm. he gave a speech on himself or whatever. And I thought that was actually really good. Um, he obviously had to have had more than Ron Paulians vote for him. Mm-hmm. There's Definitely, because we didn't have the majority. Yeah, well, I'll save some of my questions for him because he'll be on during the next hour. But one of the things I found interesting this week is that uh, there's been, I don't know, maybe three or four different s- stories, which I really are, you, know, you got to see my air quotes. I'm mm-hmm. putting, putting the fingers up to do the, the, the air quotes, the stories uh, that have been run by the Anchorage Daily News and the Alaska Dispatch, which are really n- nothing more than thinly veiled commentaries that question uh, Millette's uh, qualifications, mm-hmm. and they also question the direction that the Republican Party is headed in right now, basically uh, making the assumption that if somebody supports Ron Paul... They cannot also truly be a Republican, uh, that somehow they are either wolves in sheep's clothing or they're just crazy. <laughs> Lunatics was the word that was used at the uh, convention by a fellow speaking, delegate. <laughs> speaking of crazy, good morning, Aaron Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, you know, you you uh, you went out fighting last night over there. At the, uh, what kind of fights were those, anyway, you... <clears throat> Um, they were MMA Chain. fighting last night, and I uh, I did straight up boxing, and so did my brother Benjamin, which we both won our fights. Yay! Congratulations. Thank you. Wow. Uh, it was pretty fun. All right, uh, Aaron Bennett, of course, from Far North Tactical, over there at the corner of Eighth and Lacey, and uh, you know it's interesting. I, I read a story this week in the Daily Anarchist. Uh, that tells you something about my, what I've been reading lately, about how uh, people in the business of selling gold or firearms or ammunition or survivalist gear may be hurting the anarchist movement by making other people afraid to the point where they're going to be out there calling for more government intervention. Uh, And, you know, it's kind of an interesting point of view that simply by saying you should be prepared for things to fall apart, it could be construed by other people as being a... uh, Basically, a call for violence. A little capitalism going on there. See? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually buy that completely. Um, even when we were having uh, good times, you know, with George Bush. I remember those. I did too. 
Even when you're having the the good times. Good times? What do you mean? Economically good times? Or because no, I, when there's a Republican, no, the, the go to sleep good times. Yeah. We have oh. a Republican, we don't have to worry about anything. Oh, oh, okay. There's still the same folks demanding that the government save the world, even when we're doing just fine, supposedly. I mean, when when does it ever stop? We didn't ever have less regulations or anything. I mean. When we had good times, we passed the Patriot Act and all those sorts of things. So I don't. Those are good times. You get people worked up. I mean, obviously, when you have Obama, which is why I was thinking, Aaron and I have talked about Obama is better for our country than a Republican because people are they're awake. And when they say eternal vigilance is the price of freedom, right? Yeah. Right. It's spin on what you just said with the anarchy thing. With Obama being in office, more guns, the the record gun sales every year have, they broke the record every year since he's been in office. Right. But the article was basically saying because of that, you get people worried about survivalists. So we need to pass laws to restrict gun ownership because now more crazies have guns, restrict food, whatever. And that, that was the basis of that, it. That is the basis of it. And it, well, it, it's an interesting point of view, and I'm not going to completely discard the. And I'm not going to throw out the baby with the bathwater on that. I think it's worth. No. Uh, I, I think it's worth examining our own selves. Are we fear mongering? Are we peddling fear as people accuse us of doing here on the station regularly? Well, it's got to be fear mongering because um, gun sales right now are looking like they did when Obama first got elected. The first election, you couldn't even go in and buy a magazine for a gun because there's nothing left on the shelves. We're seeing that same thing happen again. The elections aren't even totally here yet. People seem to forget that presidents don't make laws. Congress does. Well, we only fear monger, really, when Aaron gets a new shipment of guns. We need to move them fast. <laughs> <laughs> we do a bunch of, Obama's coming. Ah! <laughs> right. Out the the, the fear mongering I'm doing is I'm not going to be able to get enough guns to stock my store because everybody's panicking. Yeah, so this isn't totally wrong. I mean, there are the people. This article, the one I'm referring to, isn't isn't totally wrong. There are people that freak out because people are freaking out. But I think people are always. I mean, listen to this week over the budget. People are always freaking out that the government needs to do something about the crazies, or the government needs to. <laughs> the conservatives are fighting that the government needs to do more. Isn't the uh, exactly? Isn't Gosh. the problem the other? coming from the other way though like Ron Paul supporters they want to get Ron Paul in so we can have the liberty minded guy in there to finally fix everything right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but if Ron Paul got elected what what could he actually get done if he had a whole house and senate of people that are trying to retain their power and aren't interested in the constitution I mean they're obviously not interested in the constitution right now right is that going to change if we got um, Ron Paul in no nope. So, no, no, it's not going to at all. How how would he effectively make any changes? The only thing he could really do bring the troops home, knock out some executive it, positions. It, it's interesting though because Ron Paul has pledged that he would not use executive power. And so, in order, you know, the very things that we were asking him to do, whether it's bringing the troops home no, I or think he was saying ending extra constitutional extra constitutional powers that we like to use. I mean, he has full jurisdiction to bring the military home, unless Congress authorizes them otherwise. Yeah. But as far as the bases, the executive things, he can do that and stay in line with the Constitution. I guess, I guess my, my, my question on this, though, is that if you're going to use executive power, even if it is simply to issue an executive order to bring the troops home, which would be in line, I think, with what would be best for the country... That would be Wouldn't pulling it? back executive power. They were put there by, they weren't put there by Congress. Yeah, that would be reversing executive power. It's not really, really the same. But thing. but it's using. Okay, but I'm I'm not wrapping my mind around it because it'd be using executive power to reduce executive power. But yeah. that, but in by in using it, isn't he actually exerting it? No, because constitutionally he has that power with the military. I mean, he's not doing anything extra constitutional. He's fought. He's uh. He has that authority. He's not using executive power per se. He's using his constitutional power then. If if Ron Paul back. couldn't effectively get anything done, which it would, it's obvious that he couldn't, then why are we so panicked about Obama? Right. Because <laughs> he 
theoretically wouldn't be able to do it either, right? Because he's a Democrat and he's ruining this country. Well, and everything that Obama gets blamed for, and I, I hear this constantly in my, my weekday show, everything that he gets blamed for is something that Congress has done. Yeah. It, it, has been, it is Congress that has created the TSA. It is Congress that that has raised taxes. It is Congress that has put restrictions in place. They won't pass a budget. NDAA. They won't stop. Obama that. almost didn't sign it. The, yeah. the, the National Defense uh, Authorization. You're talking about the, the basically the Indefinite Detention Act. Are Republicans like Lisa Murkowski uh-huh. supported that bill? <laughs> Traitor. And, Traitor. And it was Congress who passed it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> No, you're, you're saying traitor because of the bill, not because of because she. No, because she voted for it. She's uh-huh. a traitor. Get on with it. She's a traitor. Every single person that voted for it's a traitor. Every single one of them committed treason against the people of America. Simple. And anybody that'd like to, I mean, <laughs> I know that she's written into letters to the editor to uh, defend herself and her position or whatever, but whatever, traitor. Treason. That's what it is. I mean, you can't. If the Constitution can't talk your way is out of it. Law in order to preserve our freedoms, we must take them away. Jim. Yes, that's true. Well, take, take away the freedoms and put them in a box somewhere. That way, we'll we'll preserve them for the future. I'm with Jefferson. I've sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Traitor. Holy guacamole. <laughs> we got yeah, a couple that, of lines. That thing on. came up. I'll just yeah. The, someone called right away, so we need to see what they want but that came up down there during the uh convention you know we had a little bit of a hubbub when lisa mccowsey got out to speak and some of them were people i mean some of the people that booed her or whatever didn't want her to speak was because of the joe miller deal you know well she says she was a republican but she violated she, I, don't know, I guess she gave a promise that she would support whoever won the primary i don't I did not hear her say that, so I don't know. Who cares? But who but by, cares? I think, in a sense, by participating in the primary process, you are actually saying that you're going to abide by the rules, which would be that whoever wins the primary is the one who advances to represent the party. And when she didn't win, then she was like... Well, it, when she didn't win, she should have just left the party if she was going to r- run more. But not that I, I don't care, actually. Yeah. Who uh, cares? Who she cares? voted for the National Defense Authorization Act. <laughs> that was that's, that's why, why I booed her as hard as I yeah, could, yeah. and the whole table that was with me booed her as hard as they could, and we started chanting traitor to her because that's what she is. I committed treason, and the guy that came up from uh, Wyoming to spout his nonsense, he is the same way. He voted for it too, and these people will not only do they vote for it, they defend it. And try to sit there and tell you, well, or they say, well, I think it was young. Well, we didn't really know what was in there, you know, uh, until after we passed it. Then, we, then people started bringing these things up. That's well, not true. Yeah. Ron Paul and Rand Paul Ron, sat on the floor and told everybody. Exactly. What everybody. And everyone that was in Congress just said, well, that's what the American people want. We want treason. Yes. Uh, more clearly, John McCain. Yeah. Oh. John and McCain. Lindsey Graham. Nut job. Who, I have to say, Lindsey Graham Republican. is a nut job. You have to watch him on YouTube. That guy is a freak show. I mean, he's scary. He's certifiable. Like, <laughs> he needs to take some meds, go home, pass He needs out. to be relinquished of his political power. Yes. And try it on high crimes of treason. <laughs> okay. Let's four, take some calls. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Are you there? Hello. Hey, go ahead. Hey there. What's your name? Was, What's your name? Uh, Rex. My Rex. name is Rex. I, Rex, uh, go ahead. I was also a delegate to the, uh, to the convention was there. And uh, um, I just wanted to quickly, I'm on the road, but I just want to quickly say that the, you're talking, you started off talking about liberty. The root word of liberty, it's a, a Latin root, uh, liber. It means to learn or to have books. The same root is in library and in the Spanish word libro, it's for a book. Um one of the things that just screamed out at me while I was at the convention was the lack of statesmanship and the lack of historical knowledge, the lack of commitment to uh, traditional uh, originalist interpretation of constitutional law and um, statesmanship. I, I, I disagree with the booing and the thing. I, uh, my wife and I quietly stood up and walked out. I have a, an opinion about 
Sister Mikowski, too. <laughs> um, and I, I'm sorry this whole thing went the way it did, but um, above all else, we all need to be statesmen. We need to be educated. We need to be knowledgeable in, in the law and in the, the standards that hold us all together. And um, I just wanted to throw that in the ring, and thank you for your show. Thanks Thank for the call. 458-TALK is the number. Now, keep in mind, though, that uh, just because words sound the same, that doesn't mean that they have the same root, because actually Latin liber is book, but libertas is liberty. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. This is the that, Saturday morning wake-up call. Liberty and book are Good so morning. close. <laughs> they, they are close, but again, they're, they're different. They're they're different words. Different it, well, and it, it'd be it'd be well. like saying that because the word car is similar to carrot, that they are related in some way. <laughs> More like carpet or something. You're right. Well, same thing. Four five eight dog. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Good morning. Hey, who is this? My name's Sam. Sam, go ahead. Uh, I have a couple of comments. I I no, I don't necessarily think that we should be quiet anymore. It, that's that's why this country's got to the point it has, because we have been quiet, the quiet majority. We've let things happen. We don't stand up uh, and, and rail against I'm not saying we need to be rude or disrespectful. We need to let these folks know that they work for us. And another, uh, my other point was, real quick, is I turned on the radio just as one of you fellows was saying something about um, the presidents don't pass laws Congress does. I'd like to qualify that by saying, until this president, that might have been a fact, but I don't believe that anymore. So, and so, thanks for the show, guys, and I'll listen. Hang, hang on thanks. a second, Sam. Which laws did uh, President Obama pass without Congress? Oh, well, yeah. Who knows yet? Who knows? <laughs> we don't know. That's the thing. The, th- the stuff that he's been pulling, uh, well, for one thing, the health care, the way they went all about the health care thing by shutting the doors, not in- inviting bipartisan arguments, uh, bullying people, it's going off and doing things on his own, basically. I mean, there's so many things that this guy's done that we don't even know of yet. Yeah, so he, de- he definitely abuses his power. I mean, there's no... We and, we get yes. knocked on a lot because we don't knock Obama a lot, but it's because we, we're trying to contrast and make people think uh, mostly conservatives, because I know what the liberals think, right? I don't really care. I know where they're going, whatever. I don't agree with them at all. Right. We, we talk more to the conservative folks because we want them to wake up too. But just because we say we don't knock Obama enough, maybe, we don't like him at all. I mean, no. the guy's a tyrant. Definitely don't <laughs> well, like yeah, he him. is a tyrant, and that, that is exactly my point. But even yeah. as a tyrant, in order for him to get the reins of power, it has to be Congress that gives it to him. And, and who, 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 I, excuse me, who's controlled the Congress? Well, go back historically. I mean, even under... Uh, no, he, he has... He's going... He's The Democrats have controlled Congress, which is why go. why uh, Obama's been able to do what he, he has been doing, which, yeah, that's perfectly... That's why I think it's better to have a Republican Congress and a Democrat president, actually, which it worked pretty good. Well, I can't mm-hmm. even believe I just said no, that. No, <laughs> It happened back in the 90s, and things supposedly weren't so bad. But I mean, because they were, there was this bitter fight, and they didn't weren't able to get anything done. I, I'm for that. But Have if you fl- if you flip it though, under Reagan, it was a, a Republican president and a Democratic controlled Congress. Again, the unfortunately, in a, the, the, well, taxes and, went up. <laughs> it, no matter no matter which way you go, you've got the political infighting. And you've got more regulations oh. added year after year after year. The the big point we're trying to make is the fact that, you know, you have Obama in there, and we don't bash on him because you go back to George Bush, and for how many years? Six years he had a Republican House and Senate, and he was the president, and things got worse. And there is a pretty good argument that the Patriot Act would have failed if they had a Democratic uh, Congress at the time. And, you know, that's quite possible, and and that's a... That's a nasty piece of legislature in itself. Right. My brother, uh, my brother's wearing a button, I think, says it all. It's not left versus right. It's the state versus you. And that's all exactly. we're trying to do is make people wake up that there, it doesn't matter about Obama. It doesn't matter about McCain, Bush, well, anybody. Oh, but it does. It does. Because those are the people that are in charge that are doing the things that they are doing now. So it right, but it doesn't matter, matter if they have an R or a D behind their names. When oh, I'm I saying. agree. I think he's they're all, cut, with from, they're all yeah. cut from the same cloth. Yeah. I, I really believe that. I really do. Yeah. And you know, I, 
Anyway, Sam, I, let me let me let me just throw something out here for your uh, for you to chew on a little bit. Okay. When Julius became Caesar, how did that happen? Bloodshed. Yes, but at, at whose hand? Did he power? Did he go in there and wrest power away from the Senate, or did the Senate give him that power? Oh, it was Senate. Hey, thank you. I would imagine the Senate did because it was, you know, the Senate had a lot of power. The, the death of the Roman Republic came at the hands of the Senate, not at yeah. C, not not from Caesar. And the same thing is happening here in America. It is our Congress who is that is killing. I say who. It's 535 people. Is that who, how many we have? Yeah, cede their yeah. power to They're the president. Continually asking him to take more of their power and and voluntarily giving it. And and the rest of us saying, oh, wait a second. You can't do that. And they say, well, we just did. You'll know what we passed after we pass it. <laughs> well, and I'm not calling for violence or armed insurrection or anything like that. But how, when do we stop talking? I mean, Okay, the, the, the call of reform. We said, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't demonstrate. We shouldn't, we shouldn't protest. Well, if we don't even do that, when should we stop talking about this and actually start doing something about it? I, it it's so perplexing to me. Well, the thing and is, I'm sure you got to you guys too, huh? You got to figure is. out what it is you're you're going to do. And I guess what we're trying to do is everybody looks at to this political solution between the right and the left, and no. politics and political power. That's our whole mission and goal on here is just to steer people away from this infighting and all this caring about who's president and who's in Congress, it comes down to individual liberties and individual rights. Who cares who's in office? I take the, agree. Take the power back, basically. And, and, I mean, and we've seat, we as exactly. a people have ceded our power to Congress and ceded our power to the president. And if Congress passes a law that says that you cannot dot, 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 when you know in your heart that it is well within your rights or well within the Constitution for you to do the, the thing that they have just prohibited you doing, Will you go home and sit on your hands and say, well, they told me I couldn't do it? Most well, of us do, yes. Okay, well, that that's exactly the problem. We're not asserting our power through the jury, which is what nullifies laws. That that's, an, that's a very interesting point, because that is our constitutional right to hold juries and hold these people, even though they say that they can't be held ac- accountable for the laws that they break. We do have a jury system that can do that, and it allows us to do that under the Constitution. Well, and, I, well, you, asked, I, you asked a second ago, I believe that we just need to get back to the Constitution if we can. I, did, I don't know. Right. I, don't, I don't know if we can either, but we, go ahead. The way to do that, though, the only way that's possible is the one right that's retained to the people, which circumvents all regulatory law. They let Our founders set up the system where the people had the end say in all laws that have been passed in the jury box. In other words, if I'm going home to North Pole and I'm going 65 and I get pulled over in the 55 and I decide to go to court and fight it, and the jury finds me not guilty based on the state not being able to regulate my travel. Everyone else can cite that case law, and it's nullified. But the problem is, Aaron, most people do not have the cojones to break the law in the first place. Well, now that's yeah, to not take the it, To problem. take it to the jury. There is no case law being decided by juries at all anywhere right now. Anywhere. Yeah, we passed. That's exactly right. We passed the uh, platform change. Um, at the convention, I say we. Um, the Ron Publicans. Yeah, it was mostly the Ron Paul people. <laughs> we we passed a platform plank that basically said that we not only recognize the jury's right to judge the law and the facts, but we also I don't remember the exact wording, even though I wrote it, but it basically said <laughs> that uh, we also in, we supported some I don't know to force to make the judge tell the jury in his instructions that they have the right to judge the facts and the law. I mean, it doesn't matter if the jury does have that right, because one of the chairmen in the committee said to me, she goes, well, jurors already have that right. I said, yeah, but they don't know that. All they know is what the judge says. I judge the law. You judge the facts. Here are your instructions. Obey me. And until what, what our proposition was, what our platform plank was, no, judge, you will tell them the truth. They can judge the facts and the law. I mean, we would have if juries, I, if juries would take over the court mm-hmm. system mm-hmm. and just nullify laws, we would change overnight. You bet Education. we would. Edu- Education. Yeah, it's the hearts and the minds. That's what uh, we keep saying. You know, you said we don't really, we don't really want to have armed rebellion or promote that or whatever. 
what do we do? We got to change people's hearts and minds. The rev- the first revolution was won. Adam said the revolution was won years before the first shot was ever fired because the revolution was won in the ma- in the minds and hearts of the people of the colonists. The the revolution was over before they shot a bullet because the people were ready for liberty. The fight well, guys, was over. Uh, thanks for the show so much. I'll get off here and, and let you guys debate with somebody else. I really appreciate the show. <laughs> thanks Thank you very much for calling in today. We are coming up on the Fox News here in just a few seconds. It is Cinco de Mayo. Of course, uh, we are celebrating the 5th of May. And tomorrow... What happened to May Day? Oh, the 1st of May? I didn't get to support Communist Day. Oh, Dang it. We can go back and do that later. All right, welcome back to Metallica Hour here on KFAR. That's actually a tune called Crash Course in Brain Surgery, which I don't know why that seemed appropriate to me at the time, but it certainly <laughs> did. I'm Steve Floyd, and I'm uh, basically here to run the board for uh, the Bennett brothers who are sitting across from me here uh, from Far North Tactical, Aaron Bennett, and from Bighorn Enterprises, Josh Bennett. And the name of this hour is the Saturday morning wake-up call. It's a kind of a, a pre-hour to Patriot's Lament, which comes up at 10 o'clock. Where liberty and justice for all means a lot more than saying a pledge to a silly flag. Well, and even whether it's a pledge to a flag or a, a state or a salute to a man, you know, our, the, the, the question remains is, is where do your loyalties lie? Do they lie with your family and your God and your own rights that you, you believe that God has put in every person's heart? Or do they go to the state that tells you that you can, you can have permission to do this, that, or the other thing as long as you obey their rules? I, uh, I listened to, like, the last five minutes of your guys' show last week while I was at the convention. Cause I'm sorry. Some... <laughs> No, you would not have been if you would have been sitting and listening to what I was listening to. You would have much rather have listened to... <laughs> That's why I said I'm sorry. <laughs> ...fingernails on whatever, anything. Anyways, my mind was dripping out of my ears listening to this person talk, so I tuned in the show, and someone called in to ask why we called that one sh- the second hour Patriots Lament if we don't believe in whatever. Patriots. Patriots. Yeah. So... Well, I was just going to, if if you really want to know why we call it that, the Patriot part, look up uh, our website, and you'll see the colonists, the soldiers. This is just a, mm-hmm. a pa- in passing here. You'll see the soldiers walking in the snow in their rags. And uh, at that time, they called themselves the Patriots. They had no government that they were fighting for. They were fighting strictly for their liberty. And... They were the Patriots. So that's the Patriot and the Patriots lament as far as the show, us, whatever. It has nothing to do with patriotic state, patriotic whatever. Right. Salute the flag, Fourth of July, whatever that is. It's the Patriots that fought and gave us this liberty that we have totally lost. And they understood what liberty was, which I'd like to read uh, the encyclopedia's definition of liberty. When human beings are able to govern themselves, they have liberty. Humans living under a totalitarian state experience little or no liberty, while humans living under anarchy experience almost complete liberty. Bang! Um, This is from Wikipedia, by the way, because I'm reading it. (laughs) Right. Side definitions are um, free will, individualist, and the negatives of those would be coercion. That would be a negative liberty. What? (laughs) I mean, it's... (laughs) I don't get what people... A negative liberty would be the state, because it says humans living under a totalitarian state experience li- little or no liberty. So if you live under a state at all, it doesn't have to be totalitarian. You can live by this definition. Any state, you experience less liberty. Think about it, though. How many of the people within the Soviet Union actually thought that they were living in an oppressive state? How many people in China right now actually believe that they're living under an oppressive state? Some do, maybe, and some don't. A lot of people don't. They don't. But I don't want to go down the American exceptionalism, but we have a ancestry something. Our history has taught us liberty. And if we would read that, it would help. I mean, the other definition of libert, liberté or whatever it was, read Read a stinking book and see where our liberty came from. It goes back. It's a fascinating study. I mean, it really is. I've been reading 
conceived in liberty for way too long, and I'm only halfway through. But it's a fascinating study how far back it goes and how these guys came up with it. I know it sounds boring, but if you would read it and understand it, it'll give you a whole new definition to it. It'll make you wake up. It'll liven you up and go, no, more. No people are more more enslaved than those that falsely believe they're free. Here we are. We've talked about the idea of a, a pen for animals and how the animals in the pen eventually become so accustomed to being in it that if they see another animal on the outside, they start calling to the farmer. There's, hey, sheep outside the pen. Go get him. Quickly. He's in danger <laughs> because he's outside the pen. Get him back in here and detain him. All right. All four of our regular lines plus our fifth line, the the, uh, the hotline is uh, let's see who lit up. Let's see hotline. who's on the hotline. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Josh, guys. How's it going? Hey, hey calling in from uh, a different location. Go ahead, go ahead Josh. Right on, this mind? is Fairbanks, Josh. Ah, right on. How's it going, man? It's going well. Cool. Um, so I was listening to the show earlier, and I heard a couple callers, and it, it seemed really sad. They have different ideas about how to fix, quote, unquote, everything. But um, they're really still caught up in the mythology. You know, there's this entity that they can't stand, and um, they're still trying to use its rules to get rid of it or to fix it. Mm-hmm. And it just... It's such a long way away from finding any kind of solution because, you know, we've got this corrupt, massive entity that really only has any legitimacy because it has more guns than we do. And um, we're following its rules and trying to go into the party system and trying to trying to be statesmen and read more books and convince it. You know, like if people could be convinced that they're wrong about a lot of this stuff, um, I just don't think they care. I don't think most people care. Or they don't want to care, at least. So, I don't know, I feel like a lot of people are pretty lost with the solution. They, uh, they're complacent, for sure. I mean, look at how many people get a check from the government. Hmm. It's pretty hard to want to see that abolished if that's making your living. I mean, some people, it's their complete living. Mm-hmm. Well, and even if it's not, I mean, think about, think about how many people here in Alaska have grown to depend upon their permanent fund dividend. Mm-hmm. And, and you know what? I hear I even just mentioning that as being an, an entitlement will set people's ears to bleed because they have bought in to this idea, well, no, it's a return on, on our investment. But you know what? What did you do to invest that money? Absolutely nothing. All you do is sit back. You don't have anything to do with the decisions on where that money goes or on how it's invested. All you do is sit back and get a check. It's an entitlement. And how many people would be completely lost? Because, oh, yeah, I was going to buy fuel for, for this winter with my, my permanent fund dividend check. Now I can't because it's gone. That and, yeah, for sure. And going back to what Josh was just saying, with the guy with uh, the statesmanship and stuff, eh, I, the problem is we're trying to fix a, we're trying to fix the problem using the process that is guaranteeing the process continues. And the truth is, people don't like statesmen. There are statesmen out there who are in Congress, in the Senate right now, and people don't like them all that much. I mean, you've got like Ron Paul, you've got. Justin Amash in the house. We've got some good guys out there, and they're not the ones on the news all the time. You know, no one, 99% of this country could not identify, even maybe even Ron Paul. Maybe maybe 95% of the country couldn't identify Ron Paul. Maybe 5% if we're lucky now. I mean, like, his name's out there, but most people couldn't tell you the first thing about him. They've heard he's crazy, so that's about it. Yep. Um, Lunatics, as we were called <laughs> at the convention. Cool. This guy if was people didn't like what we had, they wouldn't vote for Romney. You know, like people like Romney and they'll say, I like him, but I don't know why. He's got nice hair and he's got a square jaw. Same thing with Clinton. A lot of people I know, like up at the university, political science students, like Bill Clinton, but they couldn't tell you why. You know, they don't have anything against the Balkans, so they don't really care about that. You know, they don't have all these things. They couldn't tell you a damn thing about NAFTA, but they really like Bill Clinton and they love Hillary Clinton. She's so cool. Quote unquote, and they couldn't tell you a damn thing about their policies. These people, I used to make fun of uh, Great Britain because they've got the royalty, which is basically state sponsored celebrities. You know, I used to make so much fun of, I, I used to razz on my UK friends. But re- in reality, we've got the same thing. Yeah. I mean, the, the right has Palin. My, 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 my grandpa loves Sarah Palin for no reason. He couldn't tell you a damn thing about her policies, but he loves her. And all my, my lefty friends up on the Hill, they love Obama. They couldn't tell you why. They hate, quote unquote, they hate torture. They hate, you know, wars. They hate the drug war. All these things. But they love Obama, and they don't see any connection between the two. So people like what we're getting. Most people. I mean, 
by their own rules, democracy, you know, the tyranny of the majority. <laughs> Most people like what they're getting. So, I mean, well, you pretty trying much... to convince them, like, hey, you guys shouldn't like this thing that you've consistently liked for almost 150 years now. You know, yeah. people yeah. like it. So Right, I mean, effectively, there can be no change. Yeah, you just pretty much... Um basically dejected me to the point where I'm going to pull my headphones out and go home. Yeah, I'm, I'm, thank you very much for that depressing call, Josh. And no, and have I'm, a, I'm, I, fortunately, all the people that call up and basically tell me and Josh to give a solution, quit being so depressing, the Josh that just called... He's I mean, still on. He's still on? Yeah. It's such a legitimate point. What? There is no end to this. There's not going to be. Well, and, and that's the whole point is they, 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 they ask for a solution expecting you to find one within the, the current system that we've got. And and until people start thinking outside the system, I, I mean, if okay, going back to that issue of obeying the laws. I think I think he made a very good point, though. I mean, I, I own a tactical store and go on the radio and people identify with me. People know who I am. People seek me out just to talk to me. I mean, I'm calling Josh three or four times a day, telling him about this guy or that guy that came in the store to talk to me. Usually, they're curious. usually they're his biggest fans, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's the same way. I mean, they it's same thing. They like Palin or you know so on and so forth. But Josh is right. They can't. They don't know the first thing about him. They don't know the first thing about where their liberty comes from. And I mean, honestly, tr- the the mess is too big to fix incrementally in our lifetime type of deal. Like, I just don't think we can educate the majority of the population in my lifetime, or even my kid's lifetime, to get them to fix things. I mean... Now, the uh, generation coming up doesn't care at all anyway, not even a little bit. And, I mean, like, you know, Dave Giesel is all about moving, you know, and I'm starting to really see the, the benefits of that. But it's not like the world is a lot better anyways. This is, you know, it took the world, the world, like, thousands and thousands of years to figure out that we shouldn't have slaves outright. And mm-hmm. we still have slaves when you don't own your property and you have to pay taxes on 40% or whatever. So, I mean, we still have slavery. We just call it something different. So, I mean, people learn very, very, very slowly about really basic things like don't kill each other, don't, you know, don't have slaves, don't steal. We're, we're really, like, as a, human, as a human race, we're learning so slowly. So, I mean... I, I, you know what? I disagree with you, Josh. I don't think that we have, we have moved an inch. You look back, people have always known that slavery was wrong. <laughs> they have always known that killing other people is wrong. They just have found some way to mask their wrong behavior to make it legitimate in terms of, and or to make it legal. Look at it now. People are the same way they were actually six thousand years ago. Steve, only the state does that. Only right. the state makes it legal? Yes. I don't know. There's never any time in history where murder's been okay unless the state Unless the state did. I think that's that was my point though, is that to right, make right. it legal, to make it legitimate, it has to come from whoever's in power. But it has, uh, people have always known that it's wrong to kill other people. Yeah, yeah. I get, we'll, but we'll go have right. mass wars to the tune of 80 million dying in one war. 80 million for states. <laughs> for states' <laughs> power. Point. For states' power, nothing was gained. What, what gains came out of that? Where we picked the lesser of two evil? There was no winners in that war. The lines were just redrawn where they started. 80 million people died. For political power. World War One, in case anyone's wondering. Four five eight talk is the number. We move on to the next call. Good morning. Who's on our phone lines? This is V. V, go ahead. You should listen more and talk less. Okay. Thank you very much. We can't listen if you hang up. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. I'm listening. Hey. Hey, who is this? Carl. Carl. Good morning. Uh, yeah. I was I was wondering whether you're doing any drugs to run eight miles a day in great shape. Uh, the only drug I'm on is uh, it's, called, it's called endorphins. They're natural. They kick in when you actually get up off your uh, patootie and do something in your life. Yeah, that's true. Funny thing. Did you have something you wanted to say today, Carl, or did you oh, just... I think you were, you were touching on the, the subject there about, like, you, you know, people don't realize it, and of course the jurors don't realize it, like you say. But, I mean, you got you to gotta hope they have good intentions, but if you look at it, it, it looks... Once, once thievery 
theft is uh, legalized, you know, nobody is going to go against it. When when they take other people's property or acquire insurance, require driver's license, I mean, there you go. You had a corner on the market. You control their lives. All right. Thanks for the call. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning. Who's this? Uh, hey. Hey, who is this? What's your name? Oh, hey, it's Tristan. Okay, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Winston. What's on your mind? And I'm sorry about the, the quality of the call, but I'm driving and uh, trying to not use my hand, so uh, I'm using this funky car phone thing. Um, Liberty is an individual thing. And um, it, this earlier this morning, some guy called, and I, I thought he was going to make my point, but then he kind of went off on a tangent. <clears throat> when he was talking about um, the, the president making laws, and uh, you, you boys took exception with that, um, I, you know, I think that you're sticking with the, the uh, uh, I don't, I, dictionary definition of a law. When I look at it, I look at the fact that uh, we're no longer governed by laws. We're we're governed by, uh, you know, caveat. Um, uh, no, the the president and the executive branch don't actually pass laws that he sits down and signs and passes the pens around. Um, but I don't think you're going to find a congressional act which was passed that says the National Park Service can stop my boat on the Yukon River. Uh, you're going to find a regulation mm -hmm. uh, written by some unelected bureaucrat uh, that that uh, thinks that he gave them the power. Um, hold on, I'm passing somebody here, and they're trying to kill me. Okay. <laughs> you must have um, been fair, Banks. Okay, and uh, the, the other thing is, when I say that liberty comes down to an individual um, uh, uh, mandate, a right, um, you know, my liberty is given by God. I was born, I have innate liberty. Um, so, for instance, to be quite honest with you, I'm, I'm glad you guys have the position that you do about uh, jury nullification because, and America, Alaska, Fairbanks, I'm not advocating violence for you, okay? But next time I'm up on the Yukon River and a boatload of uh, park rangers, uh, comes beside me, waving me to the bank. Uh, I'm going to take that as a hostile boarding. There's going to be an incident. I am going to light them up, um, and then I will go to court and uh, and take my chances with the, uh, uh, you know, twelve of my peers. So, uh, you know, that's the the tip of the sword. That's the the point where you decide who has your liberty. Um, all too often today, I think that we don't want to stand up to a tyrannical government. It does have a lot of things to do with uh, what you guys were talking about with, you know, biting the hand that feeds you. I, You know, in Fairbanks, you're going to be tough. It's going to be tough finding a family which is not touched by some sort of federal or state check. And to ask people to bite the hand that feeds them just doesn't work out. Yeah. So. Okay, well, I gotta go. Thanks for the call. Appreciate that. Be safe I'll, at that. I'll later. Listen to you off there. You know, it's interesting. He mentioned about the the issue of the biting the hands of Peter. Is something we've touched on earlier. Look at every single one of the regulations right now that's being talked about on a local level and how it's being mandated by the EPA. And we ask them, well, why don't you stand up to the EPA? And they say, straightforward, we'd lose our federal money. Yeah. We'd lose our – they'd take the teat out from between our teeth. Yeah, that guy had a good point with uh, – I mean, the Park Service was enacted by the uh, Congress, put in with uh, – just like the EPA. Actually, mm -hmm. Richard Nixon was president when the EPA was put into power. And, yeah, it goes back to they have ceded their authority to bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And rightfully, they don't have force of law. I mean, they shouldn't have the force of law because they're just, they're not elected. It's not a representative government, blah, 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 blah. They do anyways. The point is, like Josh Luther called in about, it's because 
they have more guns than we do, or at least they're not afraid to use them. <laughs> well, and exactly. I mean, like the National Park Service, when they took that, uh, how old was the fellow, 70? 73, 70 something. And he, they threw him in the mud because he refused to stop in the middle of the Yukon River and let them board his boat. He pulled over to the side, and they took that as an evasive action, and then they threw him in the mud. That was a depressing series of events because I read, you know, it was in the paper, mm-hmm. and I was reading online the comments. I strongly suggest not reading the comments section in the paper online because <laughs> you get very depressed. It will make your eyes bleed. Very depressed. Yeah. How many people were defending the Park Service and saying, well, he should have just obeyed. He should have just obeyed them. Even though they're wrong, should have just obeyed. That's, here we are. Mm-hmm. That's why we're here. Exactly. We're so scared to disobey because it goes back to the Pledge of Allegiance. Because when we're tiny children, we stand and pledge our allegiance to the state of the United States of America. Is basically what we do. So it's ingrained in us not to disobey, which is mind-boggling because the reason we have this country is because we had a bunch of people stand up and say, we will no longer obey. Come and take it. Mm-hmm. And, and it was a, it was a, it was over a period of time. And if you think about all of the different acts that were that were passed by the parliament that that were aimed directly at getting the colonists back in line, mm-hmm. from the Stamp Act to the quartering of troops in their homes. It, it was one. It was a whole series of injustices, one after the other, and there was no one single event that was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was about a 150-year process, if this book I'm reading is right. So it can happen again. Well, except for the fact that no people who <laughs> had freedom in history and lost it ever regained it. Right. At this Once point, liberty lost is lost. At this forever. point, our current form of government is so corrupted that it could not, I I believe, it could not be returned to the freedoms that our forefathers envisioned for us. No. We would have to have a new governmental system. We would have to have a new something. I would prefer minus the government system. Well, no, exactly. I mean, just completely people living on their own. Part of the biggest problem is that we're too big. Well, the... uh, We are an empire. You look at the the sheer size of it. And how yeah, many square there's no, miles? There's, <laughs> there's no taking it back. I mean, look, if we look at the compared now to when the colonists fought the revolution, they were pretty darn free. Mm-hmm. Very, very free. Under the king. Yeah. They were freer than we are. By far. They could do whatever they wanted, basically. They just got ticked off because of a few taxes here and there, and they were getting hauled off to foreign jurisdictions to be tried Kind of reminds me of the Schaefer Cox thing where they get hauled off to Anchorage. He's supposed to be tried right here, like him or not. That's hey, I get to go to that. Yeah, you do. That starts on the seventh, doesn't it? Anyways, that's digressing there. But I don't know. There's no. I don't think there is a hope for change because that means people that have ultimate power, power that we cannot even conceive, would have to voluntarily give it up, or forcibly relinquish it. Mm-hmm. Or both of those, one isn't going to happen. The other isn't very, no. a very good thought. Uh, the, 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 one other option, though, is you don't don't set up a straw man. I, one other option is that when they try to go out and exert their power, they're not going to be able to. I mean, look what happened to the the aftermath of Katrina. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I think there's that third option is that there's simply the beast is too big, and it will not be able to stand under its own weight. That when our government is re- really fully truly tested that it will collapse like the Soviet Union did. And if uh, the thugs aren't getting a paycheck, mm-hmm. they won't have much yeah, Exactly. Much reason to go out and exert their power then, will they? Exactly. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This Red. Red, what's on your mind? Hey, some of these uh, people that call in and even you people that are on the program and your guests there, some of the statements have been made, the government could come and arrest you any minute for that, you know. I got arrested and stuck in jail for six months for making a dire and derogatory statement against the federal government. And I sit in jail six months before they let me make bail. And this is back in 1968. <laughs> you know, so cover your butt. And the second thing is, when it talks about juries, I had a court trial I went to in a lawsuit 
and a judge decided what he was going to submit to the jury, foreman, for uh, how they should act in this case. And uh, it was a lawsuit, like I said. And uh, Frank Turney has got it right, you know, jury, you know, be informed, you know, because I'll tell you what, the government can do anything they want. And they and do. They for making a statement against the government, even, they want. Well, we have freedom of speech. Yeah, that don't work. Yeah, point taken. Definitely. Thank, yeah, exactly. Thanks for the call. 458-TALK is the number. Just a reminder to all of our friends and government that are listening that everything that we say here today should be taken in the spirit in which it is intended. This is an entertainment program, right, Josh? Completely. It's all about I'm laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, caller. Who's this? Yeah, hi, this is Jack. <laughs> Jack, go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Um, I'm not really a listener of the show. This is actually my first time tuning in. Thanks. And um, <clears throat> I'm just going to say that I agree with everything that's been said more or less so far, especially about the idea that the erosion of liberty is a long-term process. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, that being said, I'm a little confused then why we continue to have people like Mr. Floyd running these type of things. I mean, when you have people that had no problem with the Patriot Act, had no problem with George W., until things started to go south, they weren't against the wars. They were just against losing them. Well, they weren't you, against. You're talk, are you talking about me? Yeah, Mr. Floyd. That's your name. You're, are you are you saying that I was for the Patriot Act? Well, when I'm did, going off of the fact of years of listening to you on your other sh- programs. Boy, you must and, need to clear out your you ears, brother. I've always earlier, been against the Patriot Act. Getting up off your butt. But that being said, did you go to the convention? What did you say down there? What did you do? Did you even attend? I did not go to the convention because I decided a long time ago to get out of the Republican Party. Let me ask you this. I supported Rick Santorum. Is that who you support, isn't it? No, I don't support any uh, any of the Republicans. What's your What's your name again? Talking about liberty. Hey, what's your name? If you really believed in liberty, you wouldn't have said. 90% 90% of the stuff you said over the last few years. No, no, no. Tell me one of the things that you think that I've said, and tell me what day that you think that I said it, because, brother, you must have been smoking crack when you thought that I said something like that. I have and, never been for the Patriot Act. That hominem isn't going to do any good. We There's been lots of people have called into your show before, had real tangible issues actually concerning liberty. You've tried to shut them down just in the same way any mainstream propaganda attack would. You're a fraud. I'm getting sick of listening to you. I don't even know why you're on this program. Wow. Bennett, keep doing what you're doing. Have a good day. Thanks, man. Go out and have some of this, because you're obviously high. Josh, you got anything to say to that? You've been listening to me for a long time. Yeah, I have. Um, when, when did I used to support the Patriot Act? I don't know. I don't know that you did. I, I, I definitely can't say that. When did I've I only actually started listening to radio for about a year and a half here. Mm-hmm. But I'll have to say that just like everyone I've met here and even myself, we've all, well, no, I'm going to, not everyone that I've met. A lot of us, including you, Aaron, and myself, we have progressed quite a ways in liberty. All right. Welcome to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. I am Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine, here to make sure that uh, you all get an opportunity to speak on the air. Well, not all of you. I mean, only only those of you who are pre-selected and screened by... Oh, that would be me. Joining me in the studio, of course, from Big Horn Enterprises, one of the sponsors of the show, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. From Far North Tactical, the other big sponsor of the show, it's Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. And from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty, anarcho-capitalist, and uh, erstwhile world traveler, Dave Giesel. Good morning, Dave. Morning. All right, gentlemen. Uh, we have all four of our lines already on hold. The people have been calling in, uh, getting in queue as we start the show. And we also have all the hotline. Totally different show. The That's totally a, different show. Totally, right completely now. different from the hour that just came on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but we, we also I have the, the hotline <laughs> lit up. Which, uh, did you want to go straight to the hotline yes. this morning? And I believe that we are going to be speaking here with Russ Smollett. Is that correct? That's correct. This is Russ. All right, Russ. Now, uh, for those of you who or people who don't know out there, you have recently been elected to become the chairman of the Republican Party in Alaska. Is that right? That's right. First of all, I want to know, am I uh, connecting okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sound good. All right. Let's, let's, uh, yeah, first of all, just, uh, since we do not know you, 
Just wondering if you could give a little bit of background about yourself, and let's go from there. All right. Well, I was born in uh, Long Beach, California, August 6, 1945. I was raised in Southern California, uh, right on the border of L.A. County and Orange County, so I've never lived in the city of L.A., but uh, far from it. I was raised in uh, on the beach mostly, which was maybe 10 miles from my house. I spent a lot of time there. I went to schools in uh, that area that I lived in, a little town called Artesia and Hawaiian Gardens. They're kind of uh, maybe a cow field apart. Uh, went to high school there, went to college in Newhall, California, master's college. I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in history. My first campaign for anybody was when I was 19 years old. I campaigned for Barry Goldwater. I was a precinct campaign chairman in the Democratic district. <laughs> Did I ever get baptized? <laughs> and uh, they, uh, I got a lot of door slammed on my face. I am presently uh, live in Anchorage, Alaska. I have lived in uh, Hatcher Pass. I've lived in Eagle River. I've lived in Hawaii. I've lived in Georgia. I've lived in Virginia. And I've spent a lot of time in other states for uh, different periods of time. But I've lived in Alaska since 19... I first moved here in 1975 in the Sitka, where I worked for Sheldon Jackson College as a director of admissions. And at that job, I had to travel all over the state, which... Then I had to be there when the school was in, which means I traveled in the wintertime, which uh, gave me a, a good flavor of what uh, Alaska was like. And uh, I lived in Hawaii, as I said, and I'd rather live in Alaska than I've ever than any place I've ever been. I've been overseas. I've been to Europe. I've been to South America. I've been to Mexico. I've been to Canada. I've been to uh, Bangkok. And I've never been any place that I've liked as much as I've liked Alaska. I left in 96 to move to Atlanta, Georgia. And I lived there for nine years. And when I was there, I felt like I had moved back to L.A. So in 05, my wife asked me uh, if I would like to move back to Alaska and said she was willing to move anywhere in Alaska as long as it was Anchorage. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, well, uh, honey, uh, I'm going to get back to you on this. And I waited a whole week before I got back to her. I said, now I want you to repeat to me what you said here last Sunday. She repeated again with earnest and sincerity. I said, okay, I'll get back to you. I'm going to be back in a couple of days, and I'm going to ask you again about this situation. So she said it again. So I made a call to my former employer at that time. It was L.M. Berry Company. We published phone books throughout the state. And I, uh, my old boss happened to be there, and I called him, who wasn't there uh, a couple months before that. So it was all providential from that standpoint. And I called him and I said, Kevin, it's Russ Blood. What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. He said, we'd love to have you if you want to come back. So that's how I ended up here. I went, sat down with my wife again for the fourth time. And I said, here's what the deal is. I said, I got my old job back. If you want to uh, move back, I would love to move back. But I got to have one promise from you. She said, what's that? I said, I don't want to ever, ever, ever hear about how cold it is in Alaska. She said, okay, and guess what? I've never heard her say how cold it was in Alaska. <laughs> did, you know, did you know who said that? You. <laughs> Me. <laughs> so we laugh about that now, and she's a great gal, and she supports me and what I'm doing. She's very excited, and we're both on board with the, what I'm doing and what I've been elected to do, and we're going to move forward as a team. That brings, yeah. Yeah. yeah, appreciate that. That brings yeah. right, fits right into what... What do you see your vision is doing right now? I mean, first of all, the fact that you uh, went for this position after I saw the other guy, that was not a position I would want to pass to anyone, much less freely go after. What, so what do you see your vision? Who is Russ Millette in the Republican Party? Who is Russ Millette? And like I said, you know, we've talked a little bit off air, and uh, our goal is not to beat you up or punish you or tear you down or anything. We want to know we want to know Russ Millette's heart a little bit, if if you will, if you understand that. Where, are you? where do you see your position in the Republican Party? What are your goals? And what do you feel about liberty? I mean, I know uh, you're a Ron Paul supporter, and yeah. uh, I got to hear your speech there at the, the convention, which I thought was very good, very good speech. I voted wholeheartedly for you, mostly based off of that. So... Where do you see your position in the Republican Party? What's your job there? What do you feel your goals are? And let's just go with that for now. If you would. Uh, okay, I'll tell you how I feel and um, so forth and what my position is and what my goals and visions are. Uh, I want to go back to my family just one second, and then I'll answer these questions you've asked me. Am I talking to 
Joshua? Yes, sir. This is Joshua. All right, Joshua, bear with me one minute. Oh, absolutely. Uh, between my wife and I, we have eight children and 13 grandchildren, and who knows, we might have one in escrow. I'm not sure. But we love our children, and every one of them work. They were taught the biblical concept that if you don't work, you don't eat. I've worked all my wife. My wife has worked all her life, and she has come from, some people would call her privileged background. I didn't come from that background, but she has always worked. She's one of the hardest workers I've ever known, and her mother was also. So amongst our children, they all they all are just very excited for what's about to happen or what's happening, and we're very grateful for their support. They've all are contacted me and said how much uh, they're looking forward to this and how, how much they love me and all that stuff. But in terms of my vision and how I feel, <clears throat> I've told others, I feel like a mosquito in a nudist camp. I know what's got to be done, but I really don't know where to begin. And that's how I feel. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's. I can imagine. Yeah. All right. Now, my my uh, speech that you heard me with was uh, limited mm -hmm. to five minutes. I had a couple more things to say, but I said the pertinent stuff, and I felt like I was uh, being kind of hurry up and get out of the way. And uh, let me tell you what my vision is. My vision for the Republican Party is this: first of all, I was elected as the chairman. And somebody else said, well, you're the chairman and the CEO. Okay, if that's what I am, that's what I am, and I understand that role. I have not been elected to be a dictator. I have not been elected to be a king. I have not been elected to be a governor or mayor or a councilman or a community leader. That's not my goal. That's not my job. I'm not a policy guy. I don't pass laws at the state level or the local level. I've been elected to represent the government, excuse me, the Republican Party in the state of Alaska, and my goal is to recruit people, male and female, that, that are constitutional, conservative Republicans to represent the people that they represent in Juneau and to get legislation passed that is favorable to our state and resource development. I want the common man to have a, a place at the table. I want to return the Republican Party to its legacy. I want the common man, meaning the, the book, the bookmaker, the candlestick maker, and the baker, and the lady at the bank, and the school teacher, and people like you, and people like me, to never say again, they won't listen to me. I want our ears to be open, and they have an invitation at the table. We're not going to the back of the bus. We're going to be at the front of the bus, and everybody's going to be driving with us. As you know, but, um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, that's all right. Go ahead. I was just going to say the um, the platform that we put forward to the floor at the convention wasn't yeah. the whole thing wasn't passed. Um, there are a few things I thought we kind of got ripped on with. Uh, one was the decriminalization of marijuana and the uh, whatever, but the the constitutional rights issue never that platform wasn't passed. Have you been able to look at that? I have not been able to look at that platform. I've been very busy since the convention. As you know, Joshua, the platform that was presented to the convention was not passed. You know, so as far as I know, it's still in committee. Mm -hmm. Until it gets out of committee, we don't know what it is. But the only thing I can say to your audience is we, I stand on the platform, whatever it says, whether I agree with it or disagree with it, it's the platform. So if somebody wants to know what we believe is a Republican Party in Alaska, Look at the platform, the most re recent one being 2010, and as soon as a new one comes out, it'll be posted in the Alaskan Republican Party uh, website. So pull it down, read it, and we have to stand there and move forward. Now, my personal agenda may be different than that, but I can't let that get in the way because I've got to bring people together so that we move forward as Republicans to elect constitutional conservative Republicans to the state house and the state senate and the governorship. Um, hey, Russ, this is Dave yeah. Kiesel. Um, Hi, Dave. How's it going? I got a question about that. So um, historically, at least since I've been in, uh, involved, I'm no longer involved in the Republican Party. But when I was, especially back in 2008, um, we did the same thing. We did a bunch of platform resolutions and changed it all. And um, the, the party chair at the time did not feel the need to actually publish any of those changes. Yeah. And we noticed something that even before we changed the party platform, we didn't necessarily disagree with that much of it. We yeah. just noticed that none of the um, people, certainly in the in the Washington, Alaska delegation, seemed to be paying attention to the party platform at all, even mm -hmm. before we amended it in 2008. Yeah. And so I'm 
I'm wondering what the purpose of the Alaska Republican Party is if none of the members of the Alaska Republican Party who are in office follow the party platform. And then as a follow-up question of that, um, what is the purpose of being the chair of the Republican Party platform and and the central committee? Don't they get to decide, oh, somebody's not paying any attention to the platform, so we are actually going to withdraw our support from them? Is that well, is that something that you you think is a role that the party is supposed to play? Well, there's a couple of questions there, and I want to make sure I understand them correctly. Uh, people, I think what you said, David, is people at the top, meaning our elected officials, whether in Washington or in Juneau, ignore the party platform. Is that what you're telling me? Um, yeah. Well, we noticed that in 2008. I would, yeah. my opinion would be that it's gotten worse since then. But yes, that would be statement right. number one, right? Let me address that. I've been on party platforms before, and. Uh, I've never seen them adhered to. They're always ignored. They're for public uh, consumption and image. I understand that very well. What I want to do is make sure, and, I, and there's no really way to guarantee this, but when somebody comes to me and says they want to run for the Republican district of whatever, or they want to be going to the House or the Senate, uh, I will have an interview process with them, and I'll have a form for them to fill out. And that's about as far as I can go to determine whether they're a constitutional conservative Republican. And I'm going to emphasize to them, this is why we support you. This is why we want you um, to represent your district. If they don't, then we have to have some kind of recourse, and I haven't quite figured that out yet, on how we're going to make our voices known that you're not going with the program, and we want to know why, and the people... You know what I thought? I'll go go one step further. I have... uh, wanted to bring up a website that will track the votes of everybody in every district and Senate seat in the state of Alaska so you know exactly how they vote and what the positions are on certain issues. And if they don't vote consistent with those positions, then we then the, then the people, I don't elect people, then the people that vote for them know how to vote the next time and can call them and have access to them so, and eventually get them out of there if that's not what they want represented in their district. So I think that's a good way to do it so that somebody's monitoring your votes on a consistent daily basis, posting it on the website. If you don't anybody wants to do that, let me know. I got the URL already reserved. Build a website for that purpose. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, yeah, that would be, I mean, interesting. Any Anybody could yeah. do that. Um, sure. There are a couple uh, organizations that do that nationally. But right. is it does the Republican Party of Alaska have any uh, sort of binding action against uh, who represents it, or, or is it just a rubber stamp for um, the NDAA and Patriot Act supporters that we have in in our national delegation now? I mean, isn't is there any sort of recourse that the state Republican Party can take? For people who go directly against the platform, but have, um, uh, you know, a very patriotic elephant next to their name. I don't know if there's a recourse. I'm going to find out because I'm going to walk into that uh, part of my uh, duties uh, pretty quickly, and Mm -hmm. I'll be posted if we have recourse. What I'd like to do is on a daily basis, when these guys are in Juneau or in Washington or Gavels, whoever they happen to be in, what I say, he or or or. that's a that's a that's the uh, pronoun of um, choice. Yeah, right. Whenever they do that sort of thing, we have to know immediately where they where they what they've done, where they're coming from, and have access to them. And I have an idea to do that, and we could have an app, for example, that would notify the supporters of what what their representatives are doing, so that they know, and they can get on the phone, or they can send an email, or they can bombard them with faxes or or, or, or mail or whatever. Right. So Got to keep. We have to keep the heat on. So, like in the case of of someone who I'll I'll just call Lisa M. Yeah. Or, or uh, I'll call her L. Murkowski instead. Actually, I want to keep her anonymous. Yeah. Um, she voted to support the NDAA, which right. is you know right up there, right at the top of fascism, really. Right. And uh, she actually published a letter in the News Miner up here. I'm sure it was in the Anchorage Daily News too. And it was basically a giant middle finger to anybody who disagreed with her. Mm-hmm. And it was basically my way or the highway. This is how Lisa M. thinks uh, I should be able to lock you in prison. And um, there was a resoundingly loud silence from the Republican Party. Uh, there was no, from, you know, the the officials, uh, there was no denouncing. There was no saying, well, her, you know, her actions are totally separate of the party or we're going to withdraw our support of her in future elections. There was none of that. And so 
I I wonder what is the point of even having the Republican Party uh, having a chair and a central committee and all this stuff um, if the people who are supported by that structure are just going to do whatever they want anyway. Uh, David, if you'll talk to me off air, I'll give you a couple of good ideas, but I don't want to raise that fight right now or okay, that's fair. Or that's blow fair. that whistle because I don't want to give anybody uh, undue advantage. Okay. Yeah, I just I, I don't I don't even I mean I don't participate. I'm not interested in getting involved or anything. I've just wondered that from the outside. Uh, my experience in 2008 was enough to keep me away from politics forever until I die. But uh, yeah. and that that was part of the reason it was like oh this is just a big uh, rubber stamp festival. Well, I, I'm just curious if it can be something different. And and I understand you know your position right now, so that's fine. Well, first of all, I, my goal is not to be a rubber stamp, and second of all, I do want to have recourse, and that's why I wanted to say that I would like to talk to you and whoever else is interested out there, so you know where I'm coming from. Okay. Hey, uh, Ross, this is Steve Floyd. I'm 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 really uh, just kind of a, a monkey running the machine today, but I, I do have a question for you. And your name, please. Uh, Steve. All right, uh, Russ, uh, I left the Republican Party back in 1996 because I felt that the national platform was so anemic and yeah. made it was such a big tent that it made room basically for anybody to believe anything they wanted. And I felt, you know, well, what's the point then of p- participating in a party that basically makes principle irrelevant and all it's really we're interested in is getting power and we're keeping power. Right. And then you add to that the, that the goal uh, was to get Bob Dole elected as president back in 1996. I felt at that point that I, it was irrelevant to me. And so when I got home from my military service, I went in and re-registered as an unaffiliated voter, and I've not been a part of any party since then. Uh, now, you, you talked about your part of your job as the chairman of the Alaska Republican Party is to recruit Republicans or to recruit conservative and constitutional people that are also Republicans. Do you see any your role having to do with anything with people like me who were once a Republican and who are looking at what's going on right now within the party uh, with a wary eye and saying, you know what, I still don't see any reason to go back in? Uh, no, you just have to watch and see whether you can agree with this in the future, uh, Steve, and see whether you want to come back in. But you certainly can vote for the candidates that you like and hopefully the ones that we're going to run. Except for the fact that the Republican Party has now made it so that you have a closed primary. No, no, that's not true. We don't have a closed primary. and We do in the fact that if you're a registered Democrat, Libertarian, or Alaskan Independent, you can't vote in our primary. But if you're unaffiliated or undeclared, you can vote in our primary. Do you understand that part? No, no, I do. And I have have gone and I've looked at each election. I have chosen whether or not I'm going to have pick up the Republican or the other, but but sometimes I might want to support a Republican in one race and a Democrat or a, an unaffiliated in another one, and I don't feel like I have the opportunity to do that. Are, are you talking about the primary or the general? The state? primary. Because when I when I go to the, as an unaffiliated or, voter, I would like to participate in the political process in as much right. as it might have some bearing on my future. There's However, I'm finding more and more that I don't think it does. Does the Democratic Party prohibit you from voting as an unaffiliated voter? No. Then why can't you go and vote in their primary and come and vote in ours? You can't vote twice. When, I, when I'm talking oh, about... Okay. When... Yeah, no, no, I understand that part very well. You no, know, I see that, yeah. Uh, how to resolve that problem, I can't answer. You know, that's the system, and we're stuck with it as long as we got it until it can be changed. That's the way that it is. Yeah. All right, well, that answers my question. Josh, we've cool. got about three minutes left until the bottom of the hour. Where do we go from here? Um, Mr. Millette, would you like to take a phone call, or can you stick around with us? Do you need to go? Well, I can stick around a little, I can stick around a lot, a little bit longer, and I wouldn't mind taking phone calls if you have some. All right, okay. well, let's see if anybody is still on hold here. Let's go to the next line. Good morning, caller. They didn't hold. They didn't hold. They didn't hold. Good morning. Who's this? Good morning. This is Tom. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I would just like to go back a little bit. I don't have a question for your gentleman there. But let's go back to the top of the hour, your last caller. I want to know, I believe you boys got something going on here. You're trying to inform the public. You're trying to put out some information. You're trying to make a change. I think that's all good and dandy. But whenever, and you do this, Steve Floyd, you've done this for years, from the Problem Corner show to this show, as soon as somebody comes on that has a difference of opinion, or, or they might even be critical, Okay. Instead of saying, "Hey, I think you might be misinformed, or you might, you know, uh, 
need to look at it. You might not understand anything. So you immediately, why do you pull out this trump card of yours? I think you're high. You're on crack. You're drinking. Go roll another one. Why do you defame people without justification that way? Why do you do that? Tom, I, I did that with that caller because he was not engaging in a conversation with me. What I attempted to do was ask him some specifics about when he thought I said what he was accusing right. me of saying. Right. And when he refused to do right. so, I think I had him on the phone for, what, three or four minutes? Yeah. Why do you go to that level? Why do you stoop down? Why do you take the low road and start defaming people without justification for that? And let me ask you something else. When you do that, when you do that without justification for it, do you think you're honoring God when you do that? That's an interesting question, uh, Tom. Uh, do you think that you're honoring God right now with yes. your phone call? Yes. Okay. Is it is it your job to add to uh, whether or not I honor God? Yes. Why? Okay. Wow. Yes, because we are all brothers in Christ, and we are all to hold each other accountable, and that's biblical. Well, I'm not deny that, Tom. I don't know you. Yes, How can sir. you be my brother in Christ? How, how can you hold me accountable to something that I have absolutely even no idea who you are? Appreciate the well, phone call, though. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Randy. Randy, what's on your mind? Oh, I'm pleased to uh, hear from the new GOP party chair, <coughs> Mr. Russ. Uh, what was your last name? Millet? Or? Millet. Millet. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming on to the show. You're welcome. Um, in the Republican primary, I myself voted for uh, Rick Santorum, and uh, my guy doesn't look like he's going to get the nomination. And um, uh, some people voted for uh, Ron Paul. I think uh, they're all good people, all the guys that we got. They're, none of them are perfect, in my opinion. Um, Ten I seconds, was, Randy. Part, okay, I was wondering what your view is to those that would say, well, my guy didn't win, and uh, I think that Mitt Romney, if he does get the nomination, is too close to Barack Obama, and so I think I'll take my ball and, and go home. Uh, what, 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 how do you come back at things like that? All right, Ross, hold on to your thought. We'll get that on the other side of the break. All right, welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. I am uh, Steve Floyd, the man with the face made for radio. And really, my role here today is simply to uh, get people back on the air here and trying to do so without hanging up on anybody. Ross, are you still there? I'm still here. Wonderful. Uh, Ross Mellad, right before the break, you were asked by Randy... Uh, well, what's your view on uh, people in terms of uh, if their person that they were voting for and supporting in the primary process doesn't win uh, in terms of supporting the eventual party nominee? Well, I'll be happy to answer that question, but it seems like a couple of people that have called in and maybe even on your um, show at, this, uh, at the board there don't really know how to pronounce my name, and it's very common. I've, I've lived with that all my life. It's very easy to say Gillette. I've never heard anybody mispronounce Gillette. Just take off the G and put on an M, and he's pronounce it the same way. So that being said, uh, in terms of the nominee, we don't really know who that's going to be. We suspect that we do, but a lot of things happen between. There's a lot of slips between the cup and the lip. We have to wait to see who the nominee is. And my guy that I supported and uh, still do is running in primaries and is getting huge crowds. Huge, huge, huge crowds. I was asked by somebody in California the other day if I would come down and introduce him at a rally they hoped to have with him in Santa Barbara. I said, would I come down? Of course I'd come down. I'd be honored to come down. If i come down, I'd want to shine his shoes before I introduced him. That's how much I think of the man. Now, whether you uh, like it or not, or whether I like it or not, I am bound by the party rules as chairman of the Republican Party, which I haven't been sworn in as, yet, as of yet. But when I am sworn in, I have to support the party nominee or else I can be removed from office. I don't know how I did to make that clear. And whether I like that rule or not is irrelevant. That's the rule, and that's the law. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Russ. Uh, and, of course, now if I took yeah. off the, uh, the G off Gillette and added an M, it would be a let him. <laughs> That's the first time I've heard that one. <laughs> All right, Russ. Uh, Russ Mallet is on the line here. Let's go to the next phone call. Good morning, caller. You're on uh, Patriots Lament. Who's this? Yeah, this is Carl. Carl, you already called. Um, Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning. You're next. Yeah, this is Lee. Lee, what's on your mind? Well, it's about this uh, kind of. Uh, I've got a next uh, neighbor here out in the Salt area, Karen and Lonnie Vernon, and they were picked up with this. Uh, they got two trials. One is to do with Cox, 
and the other, I don't know what it's about. I was out in the lower 48 when they were arrested even, but they've always been real good neighbors. But what I don't understand, and maybe somebody can explain to me, uh, their trial now, the one Cox trial is coming up after a year, but apparently the prosecution attorney has changed some charges, so their attorney's real busy, so now uh, this uh, Karen, the, the wife of Lonnie Vernon, uh, their trial, they've got a separate trial, I don't know what it's about neither, but that's irrelevant. Their trial has been set back now to September, so that means this poor woman will be in jail for over a year and a half without even going to trial. Uh, this doesn't strike me as very right. Uh, it's it's not right. It's the uh, the nation that we live in now. It's welcome to the Patriot Act, welcome to the National Defense Authorization Act. You can be detained. There is a um, a rule, I forget what it's called, it's like Rule 45 or something like that, which is your right to a trial within a certain number of days, and that was waived. Um, of course, that doesn't you know mean you should wait forever, but... Uh, as soon as you waive that, basically they, you know, they're going to take that as a license to uh, just play whatever game they want. Did, did she waive it, or was it waived for her? No, you no. have to sign a piece of paper. You yourself have to sign a piece of paper with your attorney to waive that. They waived it. Man, thanks for the call. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Good morning. Hey, who is this? It's uh, Trevor. How are you guys doing? Trevor, today? good. What's on your mind? All right. I wanted to let me grab the teapot here really quick. I um, wanted to call in and say uh, thank you for a very lively uh, convention <laughs> up here in the state. I think we finally had some clearing of the air between the people we keep electing and the ones that have been speaking for the people but not getting through. As the new party chairman, uh, what I'm interested in is when I saw a map breakdown of the way the state broke between Romney and Ron Paul, I realize it doesn't take into account population demographics, but uh, just from the colored-in areas, you have a few patches in southeast and about half of the Anchorage Bowl that went for Mitt Romney. And then the rest of the state basically broke for Ron Paul. What I'm interested in seeing is how you plan to increase the party discourse within our state so that more of the views of the people that aren't sucked into our little uh, metropolitan melting pot can have their voices better. Uh, Josh, are you on the phone, Josh? Yes, sir. Can you succinctly restate that, please? I think he was. what he's saying is that um, Anchorage basically had, the metropolitan areas basically had the pulled Romney basically, mm -hmm. and the outer line areas like the interior here, the smaller population areas went majority, for the most part, for Ron Paul. So what he's asking is, how are you going to, what is your, your goal, your plan, your vision to bring the outer line areas, the interior, their views, and how is that going to be, how are we going to be heard against the metropolitan areas? I mean, it's, a, right. it's an age-old thing, yeah. the, the minority... <laughs> being hurt. Okay, let me say this. I can't control how people vote, but I can do this. Uh, there was this famous Soviet leader that once said, it's what's not a, what's in, it's not important of, it's not important of who's on the ballot. It's important as who counts the ballot. Yeah. And I want this to be a fair, open, and honest process of counting the ballots. I've heard a lot of horror stories, just like you have, of how things were counted and I want that to stop. I want an open, transparent, honest process of counting the ballots, meaning that they're counted and you have witnesses from whatever side that you're on watching how those ballots are counted, who they're for, and how they're reported. And I think if that's a good step to getting an honest vote. Now, how to control or, or manage or influence the... the um, I think if it was the truth be known, I think it was probably a much closer race against Romney and Ron Paul in the Anchorage area. But I can't prove that. I have to live with what I'm presented at this point in time. What I'm trying to say is I want to change the process of counting those ballots in the PPP so everybody walks out of that, uh, their district conventions, with a good feeling 
that everything was done properly and in order, and they know before they leave what the count was. Ross, part of the issue, this is Steve again, part of the issue, yeah. though, here, and I, and I think that the caller hinted at this, part of the issue, though, is that in Anchorage, they yeah. have got enough people whether it's within the Republican Party or people at large, that if we are consistently simply going on a majority rule, Anchorage right. and the people that live in Anchorage will be able to tell the rest of us the way it's going to be. Is there any recourse to preserve the voice or to preserve the point of view of those who do not live in Anchorage, or do we just basically have to suck it up and do what they tell us? Well, if there's a if there's a way to change that, I'm open to discussion. But I will tell you this: we changed it in my district by electing Ron Paul delegates, and they didn't necessarily they did not necessarily vote the same way the presidential primary voted. Okay, so if we can pull this thing together and get a proportional way to represent the will of the people, I'm open for discussion on that. Hmm. All right, thanks, Russ. Am I making myself clear? Yeah. Okay. okay. 458-TALK is the number. We move on to the next call. Good morning. Who's this? Are you still there? Can I say something else, man? Uh, who is this? Yeah, it's Russ. Go is ahead. It's Russ still? Go ahead. Uh, we proved at the convention that things can be changed. Did we not? Yeah. And we need to take that attitude forward and change what we can change and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah, good point. All right, let's try the next line. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Welcome to Patriots Lament. It's Lisa. Lisa, what's on your mind? I'm wondering if, uh, well, first of all, Russ, you sound like a wonderful man, but uh, I'm wondering... I sound like what? A wonderful person. Well, thank you for that compliment. (laughs) But uh, two things concern me. Uh, One is, uh, is there, uh, like if uh, Ron Paul decided to run on a third-party ticket, uh, would you support him in that? And number two is, uh, does not Ron Paul's stance in aligning with, uh, you know, kind of against Israel, does that not concern you as a Christian? Well, there's a couple of things here. What is your name, please? Lisa. Lisa? Yes. All right, Lisa, uh, third party and Israel. Let me say this. Third party, if I supported him in third party, I'd lose my job. That's number one. I don't know how long you've been listening to the program this morning, Lisa, but as I said before, I am bound by party rules to support the candidate. If I don't do that, then you're not going to have me as a party head. Number two, Israel, uh, I was in the dispensational camp a long time, and I'm not there anymore. I think the problem is that Israel is being uh, misdefined. I'm not opposed to Israel existing as a nation as we know it, but I think where you're coming from is, as a Christian, what I oppose foreign aid to Israel, I oppose foreign aid to anybody. But I'm not a policy guy. I'm not a legislature. I don't make the laws. All right. So thank thank I, you. For that. I, I think I've been very plain about the way I feel about Israel and third parties. Have I not, or have yeah. I answered the question? I think you answered the question pretty well. Let's All move right. on to the next yeah. call. Good morning. You're on with Russ. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who is this? Uh, yeah, this is Pat. Um, hey, what a great privilege uh, to talk to you, Russ. Thank um, you. Two things I wanted to clear up. I just yeah. just heard one question about Ron Paul and Israel. Little known fact, Ron Paul has stated that he will move the embassy to Jerusalem, thereby recognizing Israel's capital as it what it really is. That tells you where Ron Paul is at. He's for right. Israel, but he's not for manipulating Israel, and he's not for foreign aid to other countries. Second thing, if we want to clean, clean up the problems in the Republican Party, I'll tell you one thing that happened this election, one reason Ron Paul did not get a few more votes, and I know this for a fact because I got family members who were um, registering people, a lot of independents who are for Ron Paul come in to vote Republican, they're said no, and they're told, no, you have to be a Republican. They're not told, oh, you can go over there and fill out the form and register as a Republican, right. and we lost a whole lot of votes for that. It would have been a huge, uh, a much bigger success at the party level. And also, one more thing, nobody but Paul, I'm going to vote third party if he's not on the Republican ticket, and I think there will be a whole bunch of people that will do that. I know people that will write him in. And I'm proud to have you, though, Russ, as as our uh, Republican chairman, and I hope you can clean it up. Thank you very much. What was your name, sir? Uh, My name is Pat. Patrick. All right, Pat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pat, for those kind words. I do need that kind of support verbally. Can you all hear me all right? Yep. Okay. Let me ask, uh, answer a couple of things, Pat Coleman. <clears throat> Hello? 
No, yeah, well, you're still there. Pat I'm dropped. still here? Yeah, yeah. Pat, Pat okay. dropped. Go ahead. I might have to sneeze here in a second, so forgive me if I do. No uh, problem. I would encourage anybody that can listen to my voice that's hearing my voice to do a Google search on Jews for Ron Paul and also do a Google, do a Google search on Mormons for Ron Paul. Do a Google search on any adjective or pronoun that you can think of for Ron Paul, and you'll find out where Ron Paul's coming from. I'm not support. I don't... Here again, I'm getting into policy. I'm not about that. I'm the leader of the Republican Party in the state of Alaska. So you're asking me personal questions. And I'd much, and I know that you want these answers, and I, I'm very willing to give them to you, but i got to speak for the Republican Party at this point in my position. Uh, he had another question there, and I'm losing track because he had so many. Uh, maybe you guys can help me jog well, my memory. I, I'm going to... I'm gonna, uh, work against your memory and go back on that Jews question. Um, okay. I had somebody text me this week and they're like, oh, I heard the new chair of the Republican Party is a Ron Paul supporter and that means yeah. he's an anti-Semite and all this stuff. So the Austrian School of Economics, which we've talked about repeatedly on this show, yeah. is something that Ron Paul is a, a huge um, student of. I'm, an and, I'm, I'm in the School right. of Austrian Economics. Okay? And of course, Murray Rothbard was and Murray uh, Rothbard a, is a Jew, and, I, and I he was Murray a staffer. He was a staffer for Ron Paul for a long time. And Walter right. Block and Ron Paul are good friends. Ron yeah. Paul knew von Mises, and yeah. Mises and Hayek, of course, are the ones who actually kept the Austrian School alive by fleeing right. Austria because the right. Germans were going to take them to concentration camps. Yeah. So to assert. That Ron Paul, who was friends with Mises, had Rothbard on his staff for a while, mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, and, and is good friends with all these other guys who just so happen to be Jews, right, mm -hmm. is just absolutely absurd. And Ron Paul actually has a book called Liberty Defined, and he there talks is. about Israel in that book. Yeah. And none of the people I've heard who are critical about Ron Paul and Israel and whatever have mm -hmm. read a single book he's written. And he's written a bunch of books, and none of them are these narcissistic um, tirades like all the other candidates. They're actually right. about issues. So if you want to know about Ron Paul and Israel, Ron Paul and Jews, you can watch Fox News, or you can read a book. I would suggest reading a book. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, Liberty Defined would be a good place to start. And you not go, you can not only read a book. You can read a book that Ron Paul wrote, and that'll tell you where he stands in regards to Israel. And right. I'm all for it. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, uh, Ross, I, I did a Google search on, while you were talking, on a number of different words, anarchists for Ron Paul, homosexuals right. for Ron Paul. I found those. I did not find there's no communists for Ron Paul. <laughs> I just want you to know that's not. You told me to search anything. That one's yeah. not there. Well, I'm glad you searched that one. I'm glad you found what you found. <laughs> All right. Four, can, five, I say can I say something? Yes. Before? You got my tickle bone there. But when I was a young man, a young boy, actually, I don't know, 12, 13 years old, my dad drove some things into my mind that he never wanted me to forget. He came out of World War II, and he voted for FDR twice. But he didn't vote for, vote for him for the, for the uh, last two times. I said, Dad, how did you know how to vote for it when you got home from the war? He said, listen, Ron, I went down to the Long Beach, California streets, and I found a, a news box that had the Communist Daily Worker in it. And I picked it because they couldn't sell it. They had to give it away. So I pulled one out, and I'd find out who those guys were for, and I would vote for the other guy. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've always held that advice. I thought, you know, that's pretty sound advice. Right. And I've tried to adhere to that in my life, and uh, I just adore my father. If, I, if it wasn't for my father, I probably wouldn't believe what I believe today in a lot of areas. He was not a perfect man. But uh, I thought that was good advice, and I've uh, always taken it to heart. And to find out who the guys on the other side are for, and uh, you'll probably do well finding the guy that they're against and believing what he believes if they're along your uh, philosophical lines. So that's what I've done. All right, thanks, Ross. Four, five, yeah. eight. Talk on the. How, uh, how long can you stay with us? How long? Well, my wife's got breakfast, and she's eating it with our guests that we have. And as soon as I'm finished, then I can go have breakfast. How long is your program? We it's have we have another minutes. eleven minutes left. Uh, no, if, I can stick with you eleven minutes. All right, four, five, eight. Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. You're on with uh, Ross Millet. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who is this? This is Steve. Steve, what's on your mind? Hey, I want to thank Russ for being involved in the system, and. Uh, and uh, I'd like to respectfully disagree with you, Steve and David, for not being involved. And I understand I'd rather be called just about anything than a Republican. But I've I've actually participated. I was a delegate in 2008, very disappointed in it, but we only had 120 people back then, and this year we had 240. So it is growing, and it is helping. We are making changes. I just think it's worth, it's worth doing it. And plus, I want to be able to look at my children in 10 years and say, I, I didn't just lay there and do nothing. I did something. I did what I could. 
No, I, I think you're, you're, you're misunderstanding my particular point of view on this, and Russ, maybe you can address this, because I am not uninvolved. I am simply not a Republican, and I have chosen not to, to sign up my loyalty to any particular party. And for me, I look at what happened after the Nazis fell in Germany, and it were the people who were not Nazis who were able to come to the fore and help rebuild the country after it was defeated and had fallen to pieces. And that's kind of how I see myself. I would like to be able to tell my children, no, I was not a Republican, just in the same way that people can stand up and say, no, I was not a Nazi. How do you answer that, Russ? Well, I'm not a Nazi. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I believe in voting for principle. I mentioned that in my speech at the convention. For those of you that were there, I always pick the candidate that I can vote for on principle. I don't vote for somebody to get rid of somebody else. That doesn't work. I've seen that sort of thing happen, and I've been over too many times, and I'm tired of it. But I'm the, now I am the chairman of the Republican Party of the state of Alaska, and I have to go by the rules. If I don't, you're not going to have me as chairman. Which means that if, in, if in fact, you have to vote for somebody that goes against your principles, you're going to have to go against your principles in order to keep your job. I have to support the nominee of the party. Even if it's somebody that goes against your principles. Uh, well, would you ask me this question off air, and then you can report? No, I think it's fair. This, he he has to support him in his in his official capacity. There's nothing wrong with that. He doesn't necessarily have to vote that way, but he now, has to support him. Uh, I let me tell you something. I voted for Joe Miller twice. My wife voted for Joe Miller twice. I was a very proud vote. I voted for Republicans throughout my life. The first one I voted for was Ronald Reagan as governor. I voted for him a second time as president. Uh, Excuse me. I voted for him also as president. I voted for uh, Pat Buchanan when he was running. I voted for C.L. Lewis. You remember him when he was running for Senate against Mike Gravel? I voted for Dan Sullivan. I voted for uh, Dave Cuddy. I voted for Tom Fink. That's the brand of Republican that I identify with because they represent me better than any others that were running against them, either in the primary and obviously in the general. Now, I want to say this. I, one of my favorite presidents, and maybe my favorite president, was a Democrat. Does that surprise anybody? Do you want to know who it is? Go ahead. No, none of you have ever met him, and I haven't met him. His name is Grover Cleveland. Uh, he was President Vito. That was his name. President before Vito. That it was, nice. Before that, his name was Governor Vito, and before that, his name was Mayor Vito. That's what I'm trying to attract to the party, people that want to spend less money and have smaller government and aren't afraid to say no at the level they're elected at. How much more plain can I be? Well, you, again, I, you've, you've done a good job of, of representing your point of view here, Russ, but you did, yeah. never answered my question. Maybe I don't understand it. Steve. My question is this. You have said that it's about principle, voting for principle over power. Yeah. And yet you said that you must support whoever the party decides on. And, and I and and again I ask the question. So even if that person violates your principles, you will still vote for that person, or you will still advocate for that for other people to vote for that person in order to keep your job. Well, let me tell you this: I vote a secret ballot, and I don't think there's any question about my philosophy based on what I've represented here on the radio show. What I support and what I vote aren't necessarily the same thing. Yeah, no, I think you're clear. You understand that? That's that's part of the, I mean, to the last caller's point um, about me laying down and not doing anything. That's why I'm not involved in politics in any capacity anymore. Well, I've never laid down and I've never done anything. No, I'm not. uh, I've not not done anything. I'm definitely not saying you are. This is directed at me, and I'm I'm totally okay taking that. Um, There's a wedge that's driven between your action and your philosophy and what you advocate when you participate in any political system. And to the degree that you desire internal consistency in your own life and an ability to sleep at night in total peace, um, that wedge prevents that. And that's why I don't participate in any political system. So um, that's just I mean, that's just my take on it. And I think this question that Steve's raised has uh, brought that up. And anybody who's participated in politics, I remember back in, in 2008 when I was still doing that, it was always apparent to me. It was like, oh, I don't actually believe all of this. But I have to go along with something if I want to see results. And um, that's just built into the system. So there's other reasons. You know, it's not like, 
I don't know about Steve, but for me, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to lay down and let them do whatever. Um, it's just a personal decision that I want to live consistently with what I claim to believe, and politics prevents that. Well, I always sleep good at night, and uh, I have to say about the system, you have anybody out there listening has a choice. They can get in the system and try to change it, or they can step back from the system and hope that it changes. Or there's actually, yes, and you're doing the same thing that was done earlier in the hour by somebody else. You, you're setting up a straw man. You're, you're creating a false argument. There's not just those two options, Russ. What is the other option? Another option is who to reason. This is Steve. Way. Steve Floyd, okay. the man with the face made for radio, the huh? person who apparently doesn't <laughs> let anybody else have another opinion. That Russ, the, another option is that you resist the system. No, I've resisted the system all my life, yeah. Steve. <laughs> there's another. I mean, there's a whole bunch of. There's an infinite number of yeah. options. Anytime you and uh, you know, uh, Russ is representing the view that if you're going to stay somewhere, you know, you can either do nothing or do something. Um, but yeah, you can resist. You can withdraw consent. I mean, there's a million things you can do uh, within the realm of the political sphere. His his answer is totally correct. But once you step outside of politics, exactly. politics keeps you in this double bind. Right. Which is you have an infinite number of solutions and it presents two of them to you and it says, which one? And either uh, this or that. Right. And that's that's the false uh, question. But, it, you know, if you're going to work in that system, yeah, there are only two. But there's that's a, precisely why George Washington did not want political parties. No, right. But, yeah. we, but we have yeah. them and that's the system. Well, and well we have the we have system. the illusion of of multiple parties. We really have one. But uh, that you can still there's still other things you can do. But I mean, for your job and the sake of this interview, that's that's a good answer. But on this show, we always talk about the infinite other things you can do, especially with your time. You know, if you care about your children, how about, you know, saving money or diversifying mm -hmm. out of U.S. dollars and things like this? Pull them out of home public school. All right. Take your kids out of public school or you could spend a weekend in Anchorage with a bunch of fascists. <laughs> Um, right? I mean, I, to, to, get, to throw another double bind. That's my double bind of the week. Right. By, by they're, the way, making, <laughs> they're making fun of me, Russ, because I want yeah, to I, I got you, Steve. Steve, you don't have an easy audience there. I understand that. Listen, right. my, my children were either homeschooled or taught in private day schools. And that's the way that I raised them. And today they're fine, Christian, productive citizens. Um, yeah, and that's a great – see, that's – I mean, that's a terrific solution where it's like, yeah. well, uh, public schools suck. We need to change them. And you've taken – I mean, that's a great example of a totally yeah. different option that's not thrown out there. I mean, people are not necessarily aware of that. It's like, no, I don't I don't need to worry about the public schools being bad or what they teach. I can just teach my kids myself. And I always paid taxes to support the system. In the public schools, I never used them. But my money was taken from me to do that. Mm -hmm. And did I resent it? Yes, I did. But I didn't have any say in it because the power to tax is the power to destroy, and that's what they were after. Yeah. Mao Tse-Tung said, or Tse-Tung Mao, Chairman Mao said, power comes out of the end of a gun. Not with me. Power comes out of uh, open, honest, transparent process. I don't know how to make that any more clear. I'm not interested in power, and I'm certainly not interested in killing anybody. <laughs> Well, that's uh, a, that, that's, a, that's good. a change. That's, that, that's, com <laughs> that's, in the that's comforting Party. to hear, but yeah. I mean, not I, even you, Steve. <laughs> well, you know, Russ, that, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna have another interview. I, I think with you next week. I, I, yeah. I'm, uh, I think that you're gonna be calling back in. You might. I, you're coming up here to, to Fairbanks for an event. I am. I wanted to say that that we're coming up. I think. With, let me look at my calendar here. Um, it's being arranged. I'll and be up there on the 19th and 20th. Right, and that's and Saturday and want, Sunday. If and anybody, if anybody wants to contact anybody. I wrote that number down before I walked over I, the phone. I, I have it here, Russ. Okay, Josh, you can give that number out for yeah. Maria. Yes, Maria Renzel, he, if you guys yeah, want to. If anybody wants to contribute to the cause and help pay the expenses of my travel to Fairbanks or any other place to speak, I'd be happy to do it. And call Maria, and she'll tell you how you can contribute. All right. So her number is 590-4164. And, Russ, uh, I, okay I, I just want to warn you in advance that uh, when we have you on the air again uh, next, that next Friday, the 18th, that I am going to be asking you some questions that are going to be deviating a little bit here from the friendly interview you got today. <laughs> just just so you know, I've had a whole list of questions of stuff that I've been writing down. I just want you to be forewarned that you're going to be facing a hostile interview next time, okay? Uh, uh, Steve, I want you to be forewarned about something. Yes, go ahead. I got very good counsel from a man that ran for Senate in this state. said, Russ, you're in the driver's seat. You don't need them. They need you.
<laughs> All right. <laughs> thanks for calling in. Thanks Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for listening. Patriots. Real quick, can, uh, contact information, Dave. Yeah, the blog is patriotslament.blogspot.com, and the email is patriotslament at gmail.com. And the YouTube site is Radio Free Fairbanks. All right, that does it for the program. We will see you again next Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Coming up next, it's Health Talk right here on KFAR.